Hey, everyone. Welcome back to The Jacobin Show. I'm Jen Pan, and I'm here today with my co-host, Paul Prescott. Paul, what's new? Not much. I'm uh, snowed in here. It's snowing pretty hard in Philadelphia. Yes, Paul is um, on the East Coast. So if you're in New York or Philly or Boston, you're probably snowed in as well. Welcome. It gives me a little bit of like hope. Maybe climate change is not real. It allows me to dream for, for a night. Um, so I'm really excited about our show today. Um, of course, we've got Dan Kaufman, the journalist, coming on in a little bit. Um, he is the author of The Fall of Wisconsin. So he's going to be talking to us about um, basically how Wisconsin went from being this historic progressive stronghold to a Republican-controlled right-to-work state under Scott Walker. Um, and he's also going to be talking to us about, um, I guess, what this means for the future of the Democratic Party. Uh, oh, and I also want to mention, we are taking a page from our friends over on the weekend show, and we'll be taking questions at the end of this show. So if at any point during the talk, you've got questions on anything, feel free to drop that in the chat. And our wonderful producer, Kale, will be popping up at the end to field some of those questions, and we'll talk. So for today's show, um, I think I want to start just by looking at or like unpacking exactly who is part of the Democratic coalition today. So obviously, you know, Biden, um, Biden won this last election, but he really underperformed, by which I mean he won by much smaller margins than polls had kind of uh, predicted he would win. Um, and uh, I think, you know, another thing to keep in mind is that even though he squeaked by in the Midwest and in other swing states, uh, Democrats um, did not sweep the Senate and they lost, house, lost seats in the House as well. So I think when we think about the Democratic coalition today or like who is voting Democrat, we really have to break down who this party is appealing to and who they're losing. So we know that this year, um, a new part of Biden's base was kind of made up of these um, affluent suburban former Republicans. Some people call them never Trump Republicans. Um, our very own Matt Carp calls them Halliburton Democrats. And these are people, this is a demographic that shifted to Biden this year. But at the same time, as I said, Biden obviously did not win by a landslide. Um, he won by very small margins in several swing states. Uh, so I think we also have to look at which Democrats, or I'm sorry, which voters the Democrats are losing, right? And um, for this year in particular, I think we have some really interesting exit polls that actually make it quite clear that quite a few of the voters that Democrats lost this year were people of color. So I want to pull up a chart that I think uh, pretty clearly illustrates this. So if we're looking here, you know, to be clear, the majority of non-white voters still cast ballots for Biden and for other Democrats this election. So it's not like the majority of blacks or Latinos or Asian Americans or Native Americans, you know, voted for Trump. But that said, at the same time, these exit polls do show that Trump made gains with literally every demographic group except for white men. And I think this is really significant because since 2016, you know, we've heard over and over that Trump is the candidate of white supremacy. He's a misogynist. He's a racist. And I like I think that, you know, to a certain extent, those things are true. But there's clearly something else going on here if we see him making gains with every group except for white men, right? And, you know, to say the least, it's clearly a problem if Democrats are losing a portion of the voters that they historically have counted on. So I so there's that. And I think what actually further complicates this situation is that when this data first came out, um, almost immediately, there were lots of liberals, especially liberals in media, kind of dismissing this information outright or saying that we shouldn't pay attention to it. So I actually want to look at a few of these comments because I think that they capture kind of this specific sentiment among Democrats that I've been seeing quite a lot. So the first one I want to bring up is a, a, a tweet by the writer Kathy Park Hong. She is an author and a professor at Rutgers and Sarah Lawrence. So she wrote on Twitter right after the election, no more stories about the economic woes of the white working class. They're racist, period. Focus on black women who delivered votes, Muslims who delivered votes, young AAPI who are fastest growing and overwhelmingly left, and the heterogeneity of Latinx voters. Then very similarly, you have uh, Roxanne Gay, who is an author and a columnist at the New York Times. She writes, too many white liberals will obsess over early exit polls indicating that 20% of black men and a significant number of the overly broad categories of Latinos and Asians voted for Mr. Trump. 
They'll do this instead of reckoning with how more white women voted for the president this time around and how white men remain the most significant demographic of his base. They will say that once more, black women saved America from itself, which of course we did, even though some things don't deserve salvation. So I guess on that note, I want to throw it over to you, Paul, uh, because, you know, we're not white liberals, but I know that we're both extremely interested in this phenomenon of a chunk of voters of color shifting to Trump. So, like, in your view, how should we be thinking about this? Well, I mean, first, you know, she did the research. Those millions of white workers are racist, period. And uh, and and the story. I mean, it's pretty incredible. I the night of the election and as uh, as the returns were coming in, I was holding out some hope that maybe this will make us start reflecting more on how we're looking at identity. Because like you said, it was four years of constant racist, sexist, xenophobe, you know, and that was the line of attack. And, you know, what can explain this happening after four years? And um, I mean, it's just amazing that people are kind of doubling down on this. And even with that second tweet, I don't know what world we're living in, but to me that what white liberals have been focusing on is this narrative that black women saved the election for us. There's not actually really not that much talk from white liberals about um, white workers, white male workers and starting to abandon Trump. Um, so I think we're, it's like, we're kind of living on, on different worlds here. But I think, you know, with all this talk about class, so-called class reductionism on the left, I, you know, I've been saying lately, the reality is most people are more class reductionists than the left. You know, what, the way you hear people talk about why they might have voted for Trump, for some people, it just came down to the stimulus check, you know. Um, so I don't know. That's that's my initial thought. Yeah, I think to me, what's striking about um, those two pairs of comments is that they seem to only see voting as kind of this reflection of the morality of like an entire group of people. And I actually think that voters are a very idiosyncratic. Um, everybody votes for kind of a different reason. And also if we want to grow the left or even just grow the Democrats, I don't think we can write off entire groups of people or, right. you know, look at their voting patterns as just a reflection of them and not as a reflection of the Democrats, right? And something I think about is after 2016, um, I remember Bernie Sanders went on, I, I can't remember which show he went on, but he said something to the effect of, um, you know, I like I after after, you know, Clinton failed to win the states in the Midwest, the blue wall fell. Sanders said something to the effect of I I grew up working class. I grew up from in the white working class. And I'm deeply ashamed that the Democrats lost the white working class. And I remember Ta-Nehisi Coates and, um, you know, other liberal commentators got really angry at him for this, what I thought was a pretty banal or like straightforward mm -hmm. Uh, sentiment. Um, but people thought that was somehow a racist dog whistle, that he chose to look at the results as a reflection of the Democrats rather than as a reflection of the electorate. Yeah, I mean, and it's just bizarre. Like, if, if anything, this election should be teaching Democrats that, you know, you, you can't rely on this narrow segment or this, um, this idea that demographics are just going to automatically work out because he just squeaked by. So the lesson really should be like, we, we have to gain a majority like mm -hmm. that. That's got to be the point And it's got to be broad. Um, but it doesn't look like they're learning this lesson. I mean, it looks like it's just doubling down, you know, and for some people, the conclusion is not maybe we've got to rethink how we talk about identity or just recognize that average voters of color thinking about identity may be a little different. For others, it's just doubling down on, well, there must be um, internalized racism, you know, self-hating. It's just doubling down on this narrative. And I think future elections will, will show that's not going to work out. Yeah, I the Democrats have been like big proponents of this idea of demographic destiny for like forever, right? Like there's this idea that like the browning of America will kind of deliver a new swath of voters to the Democrats automatically. Um, uh, you know, as as the country becomes quote majority minority, like the Democrats are just gonna sort of automatically rise. Um, but I think that this I think that what happened this election cycle uh, with you know Trump making gains with literally every demographic group except for white men should really be a wake up call. You know uh, that the right. demographic destiny may not be playing out the way that the Democrats kind of hope that it will. But as you said, there just seems to be a kind of outpouring of people doubling down on the same narrative. Right, and you know, and the thing is like many voters of color, especially working people of color, uh, just like, you know, 
white workers are not voting. So it's right. all well and good to have, you know, majority people of color in the country, but if the majority of them are still not voting, this is still going to be a problem for Democrats. And the question is, how do you get them to vote? And if you're not offering anything besides a diverse cabinet, you know, <laughs> you're not going to, you're not going to get very far uh, right. with, you're not going to get far with it. So I think um, the flip side of of this that we saw in the last election is sort of right after the election, you know, the the Democrats were kind of trying to to recoup. Um, and I know that Marco Rubio and a couple of other Republican politicians sort of came out and looked at these same statistics and kind of gloated that this shows that the Republicans are actually now the multiracial working class party. And I mean, I thought I I found I found that statement really funny because you know that's that's the language of the left right? Um, right but here we here we have marco rubio and i think i want to say maybe donald trump i can't remember but like josh hawley and other politicians like that kind of kind of wanted to use these results to say that you know um the Repub the gop is actually the home of the working class and i know that you have some comments on that and like just the phenomenon of so-called right-wing populism in general so what are your thoughts yeah, so I mean, this is something we really have to think about. Um, you know, Donald Trump, he rode to the White House in 2016 with this surprising amount of support from working class voters. He won the highest union vote totals of any Republican candidate since Ronald Reagan. And for many, you know, if you look at a lot of his long speeches and rallies, some people identified his campaign more with promises to end bad trade deals and bring good jobs back rather than racism and xenophobia. And so despite losing the 2020 election, Trump's working class support was pretty resilient and Biden only sweeps by on the back of these affluent suburbanites. And um, I think, you know, like you said, this has prompted some figures in the Republican Party to become giddy of this idea of having a more permanent working class base. So the exact quote from Marco Rubio is, you know, the future of their party is based on a multi-ethnic, multi-racial working class coalition. Sounds like something that could have come out of a DSA pamphlet. Um, <laughs> and take a look at this video from uh, Missouri Senator Josh Hawley speaking on this question. Well, the president really tried to make the Republican Party a working class party, I mean, a party of normal everyday voters, those who don't have a job on Wall Street, those who don't want to go start a tech company, maybe those who don't have a four year college degree, which, by the way, is 70 percent of Americans. And the president tried to refocus this party on those Americans, on their concerns, on their needs, on their family security, on their jobs. And he was right to do so. And I think we've got a big battle in front of us. Whether the president wins or loses tomorrow, we've got a big battle in front of us, Republicans do, mm -hmm. to try and make this party truly the party of working class America. So there you go. Great news. We have a labor party. Yep. Um, and it's not just high profile political figures that are thinking this. It appears that there is some kind of infrastructure being built around these ideas as well. So you have um, think tanks like uh, American Compass, launched by Orrin Cass, the for former campaign advisor to that fighting working class champion Mitt Romney. And these have emerged and are actually putting out policy papers, entertaining the possibility of conservatives even supporting unions. So, you know, what is the left to think all of all this? And um, unfortunately, it's all bullshit. Uh, the right wing will never become a pro worker, let alone a pro union for force. And let's just start by looking at the four years of the Trump administration. If ever there was a maverick who could make the Republicans deliver for workers, Trump should, should have been it. After all, he centered workers in his campaign rhetoric even more than Hillary Clinton did. But the reality is that in just one term, Trump launched an attack on labor that we really haven't seen since the Reagan years. And or, arguably, he was more effective and efficient than Reagan was. So under Trump, we got national right to work for the public sector, which drains unions of their financial and human resources. He appointed all pro-management people to the National Labor Relations Board. And in four short years, they made a slew of decisions that have set back new worker organizing for a long time. He launched a particularly vicious war against federal workers and their unions. He wrote executive orders that did things like evict unions from their offices and curtail the time they could spend representing workers during work hours. OSHA, the Agency for Workplace Safety and Health, something that might just be a little relevant during a global pandemic has been gutted under Trump. And I think even most importantly, no co coherent industrial policy was created to bring high quality manufacturing jobs back. And in fact, manufacturing jobs left the country at an even higher rate during the Trump presidency. And also think about, you know, whatever happened to that infrastructure bill Republicans were supposed to pass when they had control of Congress. 
But this goes deeper than Trump. Um, Pro-union right-wing populism is a delusion because of the very structure of the Republican Party itself. No one has explained to me how the chief party of capital and big business, the literal preferred party of the Chamber of Commerce, could ever go in a pro-union direction. How can a party controlled by that donor base take such a turn? And for me, all this was given given away in an interview with Oren Cass in New York Magazine. And he, he's the started up this American Compass think tank. And I think he reveals very quickly that there is no practical political strategy for getting pro-worker policies through the Republican Party. So an interviewer asks, how do you imagine this kind of labor reform actually coming about? For decades, progressives have failed to pass pro-labor legislation that enjoyed the united support of existing unions. Each time they've run into the basic problem that while there are many states with no significant union presence, there are no states that lack an organized business community. And this is Cass's response. I think that's a fair question. And I think if the analysis is being done on the special interest level, then you're exactly right. But on the right of center, I do think there's a genuinely shifting focus to a realization that something is going to have to be done to make the economy work better for the typical worker. So somehow this general realization and general focus by some people on the right is going to overcome the entrenched financial and ideological interests of the most powerful capitalist class in human history. Something about that just doesn't inspire confidence in me. And uh, But this whole premise is also based on a faulty assessment of how the right wing has been able to win elections. So they certainly have managed to garner some working class support, but they're still operating in a context where working class voter participation is declining around the world. So um, as Dustin Wassell and Ben Fong wrote in their excellent Jackman article, they say, in places where the populist, corporatist, or national right have made inroads, they've done so as a result of decades of declining turnout. This is the case with the National Front in France the Five Star Movement in Liga in Italy, Viktor Orban in Hungary, and Jair Bolsonaro in Brazil. Right-wing populism is only political viable amid the general demobilization of working class voters. So I think what will follow is a familiar story. And I think we can look back to Reagan on this. What happened to many of those lifelong Democrats and union members that voted for Reagan? As it became clear that the Republicans were not going to pursue pro-worker policy or any bold proposals, some drifted back to the Democrats, but many just dropped out of politics. And to conclude, I mean, let's go back to Marco, Marco Rubio. Notice what he means when he says working class party. He says, what I mean by working class party is normal, everyday people who don't want to live in a city where there is no police department, where people rampage through the streets every time they're upset about something. Now, granted, he might be right that I think most working people don't want to live in a city without a police department, at least in this current society. But you know, what he's actually talking about here is a party for the culture war. There's nothing in there about a working class party that actually pursues positive pro-worker policy, like raising the minimum wage or supporting unions or fully funding public education. So in the words of the great George Carlin, it's all bullshit, folks, and it's bad for you. And they're clearly not very serious about this. There is no plan. There is no strategy. And we, we should call it for what it is. And I think it's shameful that the Democratic Party in the election, um, you know, didn't bring up these points as an attack on Trump to expose him as kind of like a fake populist. And uh, Jen, I know you also wrote an excellent piece on this question. I'm sure you have a lot of thoughts. Well, so I have, I guess I have like a general question for you. And this is something that I, I think about all the time. Um, so I, I definitely agree that, uh, you know, uh, this, this kind of right-wing populism or this idea that uh, the Republican Party can transform into a workers' party. No, not not in Mitch McConnell's party, you know? I, I don't think that's gonna happen, completely agree. Um, but I think because, especially during the pandemic, we have seen kind of occasional alliances. And I'm thinking here of Josh Hawley and um, Pramila Jayapal working together to craft a bill uh, to, you know, pay workers wages who are on furlough, uh, basically paying people to stay home. They both they both sort of pressed for that. Uh, mm -hmm. That didn't happen. But recently, Josh Hawley and Bernie Sanders worked together to sort of reinstate uh, cash payments to in, in in the stimulus package. And um, I think today it looks like by all accounts, that's probably gonna go in there. I don't think they've decided on an amount yet, um, but 
the moral of the story right. is, you know, they found some common ground there. So I'm wondering what your thoughts are on on moments like that, um, whether those are superficial, whether there is actually room to work with people like Josh Hawley, or do we not want to work with him because, you know, he has reprehensible views on a great many other things? Yeah, I mean, I think there's there's room to work with them in the short term. I'm not saying like the priority of Bernie should not be trying to build this grand alliance with right-wing populists, but it's like, I mean, A, for the fact of getting emergency relief, I think the mindset should be, we will work with anyone, um, you know, but um, I think it, this is not necessarily like this long-term strategy, but really the position should be, we're gonna pursue bold pro-worker strategy. If the right-wingers wanna tag along, fine. You know, if, if eventually they'll realize that politically they need to, to stay viable, fine, but like, this is what we're gonna do. And you put the ball in, in their court. And, and the big danger here, and I know a lot of people are saying this, it's not just me, and um, it might be cliche now, but I, I'm truly afraid that, you know, if Biden just governs like Obama part three, you know, a much more dangerous and competent Trump will come along. And I think what that also means is that someone that can do slightly more than the Democrats enough to get some permanent working class loyalty, mm -hmm. you know, and I'm, I'm certainly no expert of what's going on in Hungary with Viktor Orban, but kind of what my understanding from people who know a lot more is that, you know, he came in this context of the welfare straight state being stripped. He hasn't been amazing, but he's restored just enough of that welfare state to make him look better than the neoliberals. And that, that basically explains most of the support. So if there's a Republican that can offer enough scraps and meanwhile, Biden is arguing against these scraps, you know, I think, the, we're in trouble. They're in trouble. Yeah, they're they're in big trouble. So I mean, they should be looking at what Bernie's doing. It's like, yeah, I mean, if if more Democrats got on board for that, the story wouldn't be aligned with the right wing populace. The story would be, you know, a one right wing populist tagging on to what the party is doing. Mm -hmm. So I think on that note, um, I actually want to turn now to the question of which voters both of the major political parties in the U.S. are overlooking, um, because building off of what you just said, I think that actually helps explain why right wing populism springs up from time to time. And I also think that, you know, looking at this question has important implications, obviously not just for the Democrats, um, but for the left as well. Uh, who are we looking at? Who do we make appeals to? Who do we organize? So last year, um, two political scientists at Harvard, Peter Hall and Georgina Evans, they did a study where they basically showed that there is a pretty significant segment of the population whose economic views and cultural views are not reflected by the two major parties. So the first thing the researchers looked at um, was basically how the parties have changed since the 1980s. And this probably won't be, you know, a huge shock to most Jacobin viewers, but for the last 40 years, the mainstream parties in Europe and in the US have been sort of converging on economic issues. Um, so that means that in the US, the Democrats have actually been moving to the right on economics. Um, and, you know, I think the classic example of this is in the 90s, Bill Clinton deregulating the financial sector uh, and completely gutting and dismantling welfare. Um, and then, of course, the Republicans are already on the right economically. So, you know, the their economic views are looking more and more like each other's, at least more so than they did in, say, the 60s. Um, but at the same time that the parties have been converging on economics, um, Hall and Evans, who are the authors of the study, also say that the parties have been growing more polarized on cultural issues. So they define those as issues like immigration, abortion, um, gay rights, race relations. And uh, they argue that the major differences between the two parties today are kind of in that realm. And I think, you know, if you watch MSNBC or Fox, uh, you can see the sort of perpetual culture war on those issues being played out between the Democrats and the Republicans from time to time um, over and over. So I think, you know, I think that rings true. So the second part of their argument is that at the same time that the political parties are sort of converging economically, what's actually happening in the electorate is that voters are moving to the left. And the reason this is happening is, of course, because over the last four decades, we've seen rising economic inequality, um, standards of living are declining, so people are moving to the left economically. Uh, so what we have now is essentially a block of voters who are in many ways to the left of the Democrats on economic issues. 
So I want to look at a chart now that I've kind of um, adapted from their study. Um, they, so what we have here is uh, they basically break down the political spectrum, but instead of looking at it as a matter of just left versus right, um, they also divide political preferences among, along um, two axes, as you can say, as you can see. So one is economic and one is cultural. So if we're looking at this chart today, um, obviously Democrats are in the blue quadrant and that kind of shows that they are to the right economically, but uh, sort of culturally cosmopolitan. So like progressive culturally. Um, of course, Republicans are more traditional or more conservative culturally, but of course, right economically as well. And then I think, you know, someone like AOC is in the green quadrant. Um, that's somebody who is, you know, very culturally progressive, but also has a kind of left uh, Bernie Sanders style economic platform. Bernie Sanders is also in this quadrant. And I suspect that most readers of Jacobin and, you know, most members of the Democratic Socialists of America are also in this quadrant. But the quadrant I actually want to focus on is the yellow quadrant, which is people who are economically left, but more culturally conservative, or I guess more culturally traditional. And I think that this is an interesting quadrant to focus on because the authors of this study, Hall and Evans, they actually make the argument that a fifth of the population right now falls into that quadrant. And, you know, I think when we think of um, when we think of somebody who's economically conservative or I'm sorry, economically left, but culturally conservative, I think the stereotype that immediately comes to mind is like the Archie Bunker type voter, right? Like a blue collar white guy who's like maybe in the union, but like has some regressive views on gender and race. And, you know, to be sure, there are probably some of those who fall into that category. But uh, when you think about a fifth of the population, they're not everyone, right? So, um, you know, Hall and Evans in their study, they find that the people in this quadrant are basically manual workers and low wage service workers. Uh, manual workers maybe sort of encompass the Archie Bunker type people, but low wage service workers are, as we know, in the US disproportionately black and brown. So I want to like focus on that for just a second, because this this description of economically left and, you know, culturally conservative. Um, actually, a lot of black voters and a lot of immigrant voters fit this description. So I'm going to unpack this a little because I know that this characterization like tends to make the left a little uncomfortable. Um, so one example is when you look at the polling, um, we see that black voters tend to support, you know, higher immigration restrictions. Um, often they express lower levels of support for gay marriage. And similarly, when you look at immigrants from Catholic backgrounds, so like Latinos and certain Asian groups like Filipinos and Vietnamese Americans, um, they often say that they oppose abortion or like gay marriage. Um, and I think I recently saw somewhere that a majority of Asian American voters say that they don't support legalizing marijuana. So like, obviously in some ways, these are like kind of conservative cultural views, right? But I think the key here, and this is really important, is that on the whole, none of these groups prioritize these cultural issues. So, for example, you don't see black voters casting ballots in droves for like nativist politicians. Right. And you also see that the majority of Asian American voters and the majority of Latino voters say in polls that their top issues are things like health care, jobs, the economy, uh, strengthening you know, public services. Um, and we also know that people who don't vote. So, for example, um, just just the non-voters, you know, as you said, Paul, the people who kind of drop out of the electorate, they also prioritize bread and butter issues. We know this from the polls. Um, they, you know, say that they support uh, unions. They say that they want to raise the minimum wage. They want to increase government spending on public education and the social safety net. So, you know, to me, what this suggests here is that there's really an opportunity, right, not just for the Democrats, but also for the left to appeal to this part of the electorate by foregrounding economic economic issues, by foregrounding a left economic agenda, or again, what we might call bread and butter issues. And, you know, to some extent, leaving some aspects of the culture war behind. And I just want to be really clear that, you know, in no way do I think that the left has to or should sacrifice or like walk back any positions on abortion or immigration, immigration or gay rights. But rather, the point is like, 
I think that this is an opportunity to make inroads with this slice of the population, because A, if these people are a fifth of the population, that's actually quite a lot of people. And B, I think we have a lot of evidence that a lot of these people are um, pretty movable on the cultural stuff, right? And they're actually going to respond to a strong economic agenda. So finally, I, I want to hammer home also that the Democrats just can't take anyone for granted. Uh, we've been talking about that throughout the duration of this episode, um, but I just don't think that the Democrats can wait for the demographics of this country to change over time. And to kind of illustrate that, um, I want to look at some results from a poll of low-wage workers. Um, the polling firm Lake Research surveyed around 1,200 low-wage workers right before this year's election. So if we look at the first slide, uh, we can see, this is from the poll, we can see that significant majorities of the workers poll look, look very left on economics, right? They favor stronger workers' rights. Um, uh, they, they want a $15 minimum wage. Um, a majority says that they want Medicare for all. Uh, they seem very, uh, you know, the vast majority wants companies to offer paid leave and wants companies to set predictable work schedules. So that's like a very like kind of classic Bernie style platform. And we can see that low wage workers are very, very supportive of that. But if we go to the next slide, this is from the same poll. We also see that the same workers actually say that they're pretty evenly divided between Biden and Trump. Um, I mean, obviously, you know, you can see here that Biden has 49% to Trump's 41%. So like they are leaning Biden a little bit. Uh, the split between Democrats and Republicans when it comes to congressional candidates is a little closer. And I think that's really interesting when you consider that uh, with the last slide, um, because, you know, I think the Democrats would say, well, we're obviously the party that has, you know, the more progressive economic platform. So if these workers really want that, why aren't they getting on board with the Democrats? Um, to me, again, I think that that just shows that Democrats aren't doing a good job of convincing voters, right? And I think that we saw this actually in the recent election in the state of Florida, where a super majority of voters in that state passed a $15 minimum wage ballot measure, um, but the state voted for Trump. So finally, I want to look at just one more piece of this survey of low wage workers. Um, at the end of the, the survey, respondents were asked to listen to a series of statements and say which one they found convincing. The first statement is a kind of Bernie style, like economic populist statement. Um, so I think that's slide four. And so the statement is our leaders must prioritize. Oh, wait, sorry. This isn't the right slide. <laughs> I think it's. OK, here we go. So. Um, so respondents uh, were presented with a statement which reads, America has a choice this year between two paths. One path keeps us going in the current direction. The top 1% of wage earners, the wealthiest, keep pulling ahead. Wall Street and corporate CEOs keep rigging the rules and the wage gap keeps growing. The other path is towards working people coming together and forcing politicians, CEOs, and Wall Street to listen to us. So it goes on. Um, but as I say, this is clearly like a very like Bernie style, like against the 1% uh, workers band together kind of statement. And unsurprisingly, 67% of the respondents in the poll say that they find this statement very convincing. But to, I guess, circle back to something that Paul was talking about, um, there's another statement that the respondents were asked to evaluate and it's this one here. So this is kind of more of a Trump style statement. So, and this one reads, our leaders must prioritize keeping us safe and ensuring that hardworking Americans have the freedom to prosper. Leaders who built a strong economy once can do it again after COVID-19. Taking a second look at China or illegal immigration from places overrun with drugs and criminal gangs is just common sense. And so is fully funding the police so our communities are not threatened by people who refuse to follow our laws. We need to make sure we take care of our own people first, especially the people who politicians have cast aside for too long to cater to whatever special interest groups yell the loudest or riot in the street. And, you know, I think... To us, it kind of, the dog whistles in that statement are clear, right? Like I would not sign on to a statement like that. Um, the, there's clearly sort of xenophobic uh, immigrant baiting, um, the stuff about, you know, the rioting and and um, uh, uh, police in the streets, I think is obviously a sort of classic uh, right-wing call to law and order. Um, but 
again, the same group of workers, the same group of workers in the survey, 61% um, of them say that they find this statement convincing. So, you know, to me, I, I really feel like this just shows that there is a segment of the electorate right now that no political party is speaking to, right? And if the Democrats and the left don't take this seriously and look at this part of the population, we run the danger of creating a vacuum for someone like Trump or another right-wing figure who kind of pretends to be a populist to appeal to this group. Um, so yes, again, going back to what Paul was saying, like there is an opportunity here, um, but it really seems like the Democrats are squandering it. Yeah, that, that was really well said. And, uh, you know, like, I mean, one way I kind of think about it is more like culturally moderate than conservative, you know, and it's like you said, the people who the cultural issues are not their main thing, but it's also not the major thing they're seeking to change in their lives, especially or or at least at, at this point. And, um, you know, a, a lot of this sometimes comes down to like the vibe of a candidate, like when they're open their mouths, the first sentence that comes out of their mouth, like, does it seem like a candidate that vibes culturally? Um, right, exactly. With me or yeah, not? and I, I think you know, again, on the kind of cultural issues, um, as you said, it's more like culturally moderate or kind of like culturally agnostic, I guess. And I think the other thing is like, if we were to put mm -hmm. forth a strong economic platform, or if the Democrats were to do that, I actually think that that's one way of getting more people on board to be amenable to those cultural issues. So that's another part of it. Right. Yeah, I think the, yeah, I think the key word you used was what you foreground, and I think a great example is probably like Bernie in his years in Burlington, Vermont. So like, think about that place culturally. You know, making his main issue gun control probably would not be the best thing, or like any sort of social issue. So he foreground the economics, mm -hmm. but it doesn't mean abandoning. Like, look at his voting record. He has a D minus from the NRA. I'm sure if he went through every social issue, he would have an A plus voting record from the progressive state of view. Yeah, I mean, it's like, what is the core of your message? Just recognizing in a strategic way what is going to appeal, you know, more right, immediately exactly. to people. Well, on that note, um, it looks like we have yeah. Dan Kaufman joining us now. So he is going to pick up the conversation. Hi, Dan. Welcome. Hi, Jen. Hi, Paul. Thank hey, you Dan. for having me. Let me, let me properly introduce you. Um, so uh, Dan Kaufman is a, is a writer. He wrote an um, excellent book that I recently read uh, titled... Um, Where's the title? Oh, Fall of, uh, Fall of Wisconsin, The Conservative Conquest of a Progressive Bastion in, in the Future of American Politics. And I think the story of the fall of the industrial Midwest is like the perfect way to encapsulate the fall of the Democratic Party overall. Um, he's, he also has written for the New York Times Magazine and The New Yorker. Um, so welcome, Dan. Hi, thanks for having me. Great yeah. show. I, I really enjoyed listening to you guys. So, uh, so thank, thank you, Dan. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, I mean, and I think you're like the perfect guest to uh, kind of distill some of what we're talking about in a specific place. Um, so we can uh, get right into it. I mean, my first question is, um, you know, can you describe like what was the Wisconsin way? So how did Wisconsin become such a beacon of like progressive and even in some cases you can almost call it like social democratic politics um, mm -hmm. and sort of what were some of the crowning achievements of Wisconsin progressivism? Sure, sure. No, I think you could definitely call it a social democratic tradition. Um, kind of started with in the mid 19th century with the waves of Scandinavian and German immigrants. A lot of the Germans were fleeing refugees from the failed revolution in 1848. They largely settled in Milwaukee. Um, and the Scandinavians were mainly farmers and they brought with them a kind of communitarian ethos forged out of the difficult conditions. They were fleeing a lot of repressive uh, politics in Norway. Um, they disproportionately kind of joined the trade union movement, uh, Finnish miners in Northern Wisconsin and formed agricultural cooperatives um, in Western Wisconsin and in Milwaukee. Um, they, they really established uh, the socialist party in America, a guy named Victor Berger a school teacher, an Austria, an Austria-Hungarian Jewish immigrant, uh, kind of spearheaded this, and um, he, the socialists in Milwaukee, uh, it, became, it was derided as sewer socialism. They were very focused on achieving kind of concrete gains for their working class constituents, and most of them were working class um, people themselves. In fact, the first mayor was a guy named Emil Seidel. He was elected in 1910. The other big part of Wisconsin progressivism 
from a kind of top-down perspective, it was a person named Bob La Follette, fighting Bob La Follette. And he was governor and senator and later ran as a third party presidential candidate in 1924. And he kind of marshaled these forces and they had, um, they were kind of growing. This agrarian populism was very strong in the late 19th century. But also there was the Republican party, which was an anti-abolitionist party was founded in a one room schoolhouse in a town called Ripon, Wisconsin. And a lot of the people that founded it had been members of a failed um, kind of non-Marxist socialist commune um, nearby. Um, so it was a very, uh, there was a lot of different strains of this ferment. And, um, and in 1910, uh, the socialists won the mayor's office in Milwaukee and um, tons of assembly seats and state senate seats. And La Follette's progressives won vir virtually everywhere else. Um, and they started enacting incredibly progressive legislation, um, including the first workers' comp bill, um, many uh, the first progressive income tax, which is very important because it had failed everywhere else. So people could see that um, money was going to improve their communities. There were a lot of um, safeguards in it so that it wasn't just being squandered. Um, and a lot of the, the third element was the University of Wisconsin, which was a bastion of kind of the social gospel music, uh, social gospel um, movement, and which basically, there was a very progressive economics department, and there were people like John Commons and Rich, Richard Eli that uh, worked closely with the sewer socialists in Milwaukee to develop the workers' compensation law. That was the first workers' compensation law in the country, and it became a national model. So all of these things helped establish this tradition, and what was also important for La Follette was um, democratic participation, lowercase d, democratic participation. He, he really believed that democracy depended on what he called active citizenship. So there were a lot of reforms to encourage people to participate more for a long time until Scott Walker took over. It was, um, it was one of the easiest places to, to vote. You, there was same day registration. And that was a kind of bipartisan tradition that endured, in fact, um, it was also a very strong bastion of labor rights. Um, AFSME was founded in Madison in 1932, um, and uh, it was the first state to recognize collective bargaining rights for municipal workers in the late 50s, and it was the first state, and that was expanded to all state workers by a Republican governor, actually, in the late 60s. So that was kind of the, some of the background of some of these reforms, and they became nationalized. You know, the Social Security Act was drafted basically by Wisconsinites. And um, they really fled to Washington, moved to Washington during the New Deal. And were, uh, some people say that the New Deal was really, uh, a lot of it was Bob LaFollette's 1924 progressive platform kind of writ large. And um, they had a huge influence on it. Um, particularly the social insurance uh, programs that were developed then. Unemployment insurance was first enacted in Wisconsin, actually prior to uh, it being included in the 1935 bill. So that's, that's a little bit of the background. And again, it was the old, Milwaukee was the only large American city to be governed by socialist mayors for a sustained length of time. It was about 40 years. The last socialist mayor, um, Frank, Se uh, Frank Seidler, an amazing guy. I interviewed his daughter, who's, who was mentioned in the book, uh, won his last term in um, 1956. He, he ended in 1960. And um, unfortunately, you know, some of the racial divisions kind of helped topple him. He was getting death threats. Uh, he really believed in public housing. And he pointedly, uh, when they were um, inaugurating an expansion of a public housing project in Milwaukee, he pointedly handed keys to a white family and to an African American family at the same time. It caused a massive uh, backlash. And you saw the beginnings of right-wing populism, actually, in Wisconsin. George Wallace did, did very well in uh, South Milwaukee. And, and the seeds of this economic anxiety were already present. There was a lot of, um, you know, realtors would go in and create a scare. And these um, uh, The African-Americans were moving in, their property values would go down. And so th this kind of white flight was starting. And it was a real... Um, and, and Wallace did very well there um, among some uh, Polish working class uh, people. Um, and, and, and you saw this kind of 
the seeds for it. And of course, Joe McCarthy was there, although uh, that's a bit of a more complicated story that I won't uh, get into. Um, he, he kind of didn't really attack some of the social welfare, uh, the, the state level stuff. Uh, in fact, Zeidler, uh, he never went after Zeidler and Zeidler won re-election in 1952, the banner year for the Red Scare. So it was kind of an interesting dynamic that you had McCarthy and the socialist mayor. But it's always been an unusual state that way. And just to clarify for people, the Socialist Party leader, Victor Berger, is not the same Vic Berger from YouTube. Um, so <laughs> no, I don't think so. know that. Yeah, um, no. So, you know, I kind of see like two focal points in the story of like the decline of this Wisconsin social democracy. And so one of them is Scott Walker, who I'll come to in a minute. But I think the first is, is the Powell memo. And I was very glad you discussed this in the book. Can you explain to people what was the Powell memo Powell memo, and how did it influence politics in the decades after it was written? Sure. Um, Lewis Powell was a Supreme Court justice, and he was nominated by Richard Nixon in, I think, 1971. But before that, he was a corporate lobbyist for the tobacco industry and a kind of burger of Richmond, Virginia. And he was very good friends with a guy uh, from the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. And they were very alarmed at people like Ralph Nader and the kind of um, the success that they were having, the consumer movement, consumer rights movement, and just the general um, kind of constraints that were being um, imposed on, on business uh, in terms of labor rights, environmental rights, and so on. And Powell drafted a secret memo to his friend, basically outlining a strategy that the right should take up, that they should... Um, Kind of create a guerrilla war. They felt like the American free enterprise system was at risk and that they needed to take over all aspects of um, government, mass media, um, universities, and so on, and, and really forcefully exert um, a counter message based in the, their kind of libertarian ideology. And this, they weren't alone in. Um, propagating this. Some of this stuff was happening at the same time, but it really crystallized this thinking of the right. And you had people like Paul Weyrich, who um, was an aide to a conservative senator in Colorado, and he started, um, you know, the Heritage Foundation, and then later kind of took over a group called ALEC, which was very important on the state level. It's called, it's the American Legislative Exchange Council. And they basically draft model bills written by corporate lobbyists and um, right-wing think tanks. And as, as a person in the book, one of there's a very progressive Democratic state senator in Wisconsin who I follow, Chris Taylor, she recently retired. Um, and she said, um, you know, it's like a three-legged stool and the state legislators are the junior partners. And she would go to these conferences because it's officially nonpartisan uh, in order for it to have its non-taxable, uh, non-tax status with the IRS and kind of report back to her constituents on what was coming next. And a lot of the anti-labor legislation, right to work, there's model bills that were virtually verbatim, uh, a right to work bill in Michigan that was passed and then later passed in Wisconsin and first in Indiana and in the upper Midwest and right to work had not been passed in decades prior to this resurgence of this movement. So I think the Powell memo kind of spearheaded this conservative infrastructure but, you know, in a way, it also goes back even earlier to the New Deal itself. And there's a wonderful book by Kim Phillips Fine called uh, Invisible Hands. And there was always a contingent of industrialists who never accepted the New Deal. And they coalesced around Reagan, John Birch Society. Some of them were from Wisconsin, uh, a guy named William Greedy, militantly anti-labor. The Another group is the Bradley Foundation. And that was founded, that came out of the Allen Bradley Corporation. Um, and they were all early members of the Birch Society. And there was always um, a very virulent hostility to the New Deal that never really, it, it, it was dormant for a while. And people often talk about this memo that Dwight Eisenhower, a letter he wrote to his brother saying, if anybody accepts, doesn't accept the New Deal, you know, they'll be dead. But in a weird way, the letter is interesting because he's needing to convince this guy because there's already this ferment. Uh, that's going on. And so the Powell memo, in some ways, it's a new thing, but I also see it as kind of an extension of this hostility to, um, to any kind of imposition 
on corporate profits. And um, and so I think um, it is really interesting. And you have all these groups, the Cato, the Cato Foundation, uh, Cato Institute, I'm sorry, uh, the Bradley Foundation in the early 70s. And they, they're very patient and they were slowly building power and they really focused on a state level. Um, and that was very important in terms of Wisconsin. And I think Wisconsin became a very powerful symbol for their success because it had been this progressive bastion and that had already eroded uh, to a degree. Tommy Thompson, the first charter school was actually in Milwaukee and he had spoken at ALEC too. Milton Friedman was an honorary chair. It was a very important group. Um, and by eroding the states, it's kind of like you're, you're taking away the pilings of, you know, and, and that's in some sense what happened in Wisconsin. And then of course, Walker launched this, um, this bill that became called Act 10, which was a total attack on public sector employees. Um, and he did it with a strategy that Trump, I think, you, and getting to your point about right-wing populism, he, Walker also was a right-wing populist to a degree. He, he would, um, you know, he would drive around on his Harley Davidson. It was really like symbolism, but there was, um, he had this annual tour on his Harley. Um, he said he claimed to bring a ham sandwich and his brown bag lunch every day. And he famously said to a billionaire donor, you know, who wanted the state to become right to work, he said, well, we're gonna use divide and conquer. This was a secret meeting. And he was gonna pit the public sector employees against the private sector. And they always praise like the building trades and so on. And Trump did that too. In fact, I saw Trump speak in 2017 at the National Building Trades Conference as Reagan had done before him. That was where Reagan was shot, actually was leaving that conference in Washington. So it, it's a very interesting dynamic and Nixon did it as well with the hard hat movement and so on. It's been there for a long time. And, you know, um, it's unfortunately successful, particularly in a context of scarcity. And, and that's what you have. In 2010 was a very difficult year for most working class people. And Walker was able to stoke resentment against teachers and other public employees. Yeah, you actually read my mind about where I was going with the questions, but just maybe as a specific question about the labor movement, you know, it's it's easy to be like these idiots, idiot labor leaders who would support Scott Walker. But I mean, what were kind of the incentives and the the material things that were would push unions that, as I read in the book, I mean, a lot of them kind of knew better or, you know, were wise to what Scott Walker, Scott Walker was, but what were sort of the material incentives that would drive them to- Just Very narrow parochial gains, like promises of jobs in particular. There was only a couple that actually officially endorsed them the first time. It was the operating engineers and then the carpenters union and the pipe fitters, I think gave him money. But a lot of the building trades are very conservative and there were promises that he made to improve the roads and the roads had been going down. And again, you can't separate Walker's success from the democratic failings before him. Jim Doyle had also demonized the previous democratic governor in Wisconsin prior to Scott Walker had demonized public employees and promised to cut 10,000 of them, the university, no one had gotten a raise in a long time. Uh, and that was like, you know, it's a symbol of pride for the entire state, including for a lot of Republicans. The University of Wisconsin was a world-class research institution. And there was also this tradition of the Wisconsin idea where the faculty are called upon, it's kind of a moral obligation to help the citizens of the state as a whole. And they did that for a long time um, in an unusual way, not very atypical in the United States. So, um, but a lot, there was a lot of starving of the public sector going on and um, and the Democrats did it to a lesser degree, but kind of paved the way uh, that demonization uh, didn't help. And and so I think um, you know there were promises that Walker would invest in certain sectors. Um, he didn't really do it, but um, and then there is some conservative cultural uh, aspects to some of the building trades workers, but um, but he was able to peel off a significant, uh, and again, the, the stoking of resentment that the public employees were takers and the separating of the good unions from the bad ones that Reagan did that as well. He, you know, when he was breaking the PATCO strike, he said, you know, I'm a proud union member, I've led strikes, but the pub government workers, that's a different story. So he tried to, you know, kind of separate these two and split the factions and, and it worked to a degree. Um, 
and it, it's always worked to a degree. I mean, still the majority of um, of union members didn't vote for Walker, but he was able to cleave off enough of them, just as Trump did, to to narrowly win. So. So I think a follow up question I have, which, you know, you actually start to get at a little is in Wisconsin, while Scott Walker is kind of perfecting divide and conquer, what is the Democrats strategy? Like, why were they unable to sort of beat back this assault in, as you say, what was once this progressive strong? Well, it's really interesting. I mean, I think it's also worth mentioning and worth emphasizing that that the protests against Act 10 were the first mass labor action in decades. I mean, there were more than 100,000 people at the state capitol. It was really a movement kind of in some ways not unrelated to what was happening in the Arab Spring in that year. I mean, there was definitely, it, it was different. And, and as one person in my book said, you know, we didn't even, I didn't know how many people would show up. This was for a local union rally rally because um, there was no muscle memory for a mass labor action in the United States. But it shocked everyone, including Walker, the scale of pushback. And I think it did tap into Wisconsin's progressive roots. Um, but the Democrats, the national Democrats, did nothing, um, basically. And there was a lot of distancing from Obama. In fact, he, his deputy press secretary, when Scott Walker was being recalled, uh, said, you know, this, this doesn't, you know, they were begging him to come and campaign for Tom Barrett, Walker's opponent. And he said, you know, she said, this doesn't have anything to do with us. This is about a guy being uh, recalled for governor, which was, I think, very telling. Um, and I think um, on the state levels, the Democrats were much more, this, the, the state senators, they, they fled to Illinois to try to delay the bill um, because they needed a quorum. So there was a much more of a traditional alignment between the Democratic Party and labor on the state level, at least in the state legislature. Um, and they were very helpful. They opened their doors to the constituents. They had meetings outside on the Capitol grounds. It was quite remarkable. Mark Pocan, who's now a congressman, was an assembly person then. Um, and he was, you know, a very active and in terms of opening the door. And these were not just people from Madison, or, you know, they're from all over the state. Uh, teachers and their supporters and so on um, coming down to um, to testify against the bill and try to delay it so that public opposition could be built. But the National Party did nothing. And in fact, you know, Arne Duncan, who was Obama's Secretary of Education, you know, they were very critical often of teachers unions. So again, you have very mixed messaging. While he tepidly criticized, Obama tepidly criticized uh, the attacks on collective bargaining, you know, a lot of times they were demonizing the teachers unions. And, you know, this was also Obama. People forget that he ran as a pro-labor candidate in 2007 during the campaign in South Carolina. He said, if collective bargaining rights are ever um, under attack, I'll put on a pair of comfortable walking shoes and march on the picket line with you. Of course, he never did. And, um, you know, and many people in Wisconsin very much remembered that. And, uh, and I think it, um, it's like there was disaffection, you know, and I think that's where the state is at now. Um, there isn't a permanent political cultural change, but it's like these very narrow battles, like what you saw in 2020, where um, somebody will narrowly win by less than 1%. Whereas in 2008, Obama actually won by 14 points. And I think that was partly because he did run more as an economic populist, which does uh, play very well there. I mean, maybe Obama just couldn't pick out the right <laughs> shoes, you know? It's hard. It's hard. Um, so Biden did win. Um, so was, was Biden's ability to win back Wisconsin a sign that the Democrats are beginning to regain lost working class voters? And if not, I mean, what trajectory do you see the Democratic Party heading towards? Or in other words, like, what is their new coalition if it's not what it used to be in Wisconsin? I think it's a pretty uh, a precarious coalition that re relies a lot on suburban voters um, that doesn't, um, I, I think it's it's very precarious. And a lot of Biden's win, I think, was driven by anti-Trump sentiment. Um, Trump did very well, again, in the rural areas, which I wrote a piece in The New Yorker, there's a you know, dairy farming is going through a massive consolidation. Um, like other, it's probably the last 
person standing in terms of American agriculture where a family farmer might survive. And that is changing right now. And it's causing a rash, uh, an epidemic of suicides in the state. Um, so Trump did very well there. There was a lot of promises, as you've talked about in your show, false promises, but he knew what to say um, to, pro to, you know, knew that people were hurting and, and promised them, un you know, unachievable things and certainly things that he would never do. But, um, but nonetheless, he paid attention. He campaigned relentlessly around the Rust Belt um, all throughout his presidency and um, went to Wisconsin many times. He went to Youngstown, Ohio. Um, and it was really interesting because I, I wrote a piece about the closing of a GM plant there near Youngstown. And then you had, you know, in the debate, uh, Biden versus Trump, in, it was in Cleveland, 60 miles away. And, and Biden never brought up the closing of this plant that cost 5,000 people their jobs. And people have fled all over the Midwest to try to save their pensions um, because you need 30 years and so on. Um, so it was a real, a really um, kind of telling, you know, um, abstention on his part. Um, so I don't think it's a, it's a stable coalition. Um, I do think an economic populist could have done much better. Sanders did incredibly well in the 2016 primary. Um, and I think rural voters are also um, persuadable. Wisconsin has a deep tradition of rural economic populism, um, but that is not what the Democratic Party is running on. And they've just nominated Tom Vilsack, who is very tied to corporate agriculture as the Secretary of um, Agriculture once again. And I, I just don't see it as very stable. Um, like, you, like you said in the earlier part of your show, um, another type of right-wing populist could come along, someone that's somewhat less offensive than Trump and, and so on, and, and do very, very well with even a, just modest promises that could be delivered that wouldn't offend their, their donors too much. So on the subject of economic populism, um, I think, you know, those of us who are supporters or were supporters of Bernie Sanders were obviously very excited to see how well he did in Wisconsin in 2016. Um, and I think, you know, just speaking for myself, I like that feels right to me that like a message of strong economic populism can win over some of these rural voters um, or, you know, industrial workers in the Midwest uh, or especially in Wisconsin, which, as you say, has kind of this history of economic populism. But I want to talk about one candidate in particular, and that's Randy Bryce. I know you've written about him before, and I bring him up because, you know, he's kind of like a Bernie Krat. He's from Wisconsin. He He's almost like a picture-perfect candidate, right? Like, he ran on an economic populist platform. He's a veteran, a union man, um, an iron worker, the iron stash, um, mm -hmm. and yet he didn't win. Um, so talk a little bit about him. Uh, like, what's going on there? Bernie, I mean, Randy is, is an amazing character. He was, he's an iron worker that I befriended who was very active in the um, Act 10 protests. And I think unlike a lot of the building trades members, he saw the attack on the teachers as an attack on labor in general. He definitely feels um, a general solidarity with all members of the working class. Um, I think what happened was um, the race shifted Paul Ryan got out of the race, and that was more of a classic David and Goliath battle. Um, there was some, um, it's it's a gerrymandered district, uh, so it's very hard for um, a Democrat to do well. Most, uh, Wisconsin is heavily, heavily gerrymandered, and there was a Supreme Court case about it. Um, and, and I think there were also some, um, you know, not particularly scandalous, but revelations about um, he had some uh, an arrest related to uh, a DUI and some other things that came out. They cleverly got his brother, who's a conservative uh, Milwaukee police officer, to uh, uh, to um, partake in an ad for his opponent, Brian Style. And um, so it was a confluence of forces. Um, I think it was always going to be a tough district for him to run. And I think for me, you know, personally, I, I mean, Randy is, is an amazing character. It was very interesting as a, as a, just as a labor organizer, as a one man kind of labor organizer. And that's the area when I was most writing about him and kind of 
most fascinating about him. And I think that tells you something also about the Act 10 movement. Some of the more militant labor leaders were always concerned when all of the effort became focused on the recall against Scott Walker and the protests at the Capitol, which were really massive and sustained. That vanished. That energy just vanished when everything became about recalling Scott Walker. And a lot of people feel like that was a big mistake in retrospect because it played to Walker's terms. There was, you know, he just flooded it with dark money. And then the Democrats ran the same candidate that they ran, uh, who had just lost to Walker a uh, little more than a year before. So it was um, a strategy that I think, it's just an interesting thing that I think Wisconsin revealed, like the limits of electoral politics or the need to kind of do both um, that is sometimes lost. Um, but that was a really um, vibrant kind of labor uprising. And then it, it shifted into an electoral strategy. And I think, you know, uh, when I was writing about Randy, he was a very, um, he was really this one man labor organizer. And I really admired, and I do admire him and, and his dedication and so on. And then things shifted into more like, you know, different kinds of messaging. As a politician, you have to, you have to shift. And, and I think um, that can be difficult. Although I think, you know, largely it was these structural problems that, that defeated him. And the fact that it was no longer Paul Ryan, who was a kind of symbol of, of the antithesis of what Randy was, you know. So just as a quick follow up to that, now that, you know, the context or the conditions in Wisconsin are a little bit different, do you see a candidate like Randy Bryce um, maybe doing better there? Or do you see a new kind of space for this sort of economic populist, uh, like labor supported candidate to make gains? I think there is that that space. And there's, there's some, uh, and I'm blanking on their names, there are some state legislative uh, leaders that are running that way. Um, and they do have a very talented, the, the head of the state Democratic Party is a very talented kind of guy named Ben Wickler, um, who I think tactically the Democratic Party is much better than it, it was previously. As far as messaging, they still, the, the larger elements in it, the more powerful elements in it still seemed wedded to um, a mild um, kind of political program. I will say that Tony Evers is a little bit of an underestimated, um, he's the governor of Wisconsin, he defeated Walker, and he he's very understated. He was the state superintendent of schools. He has a deep, deep um, faith in public education, a deep, uh, and I think he also comes from a small town in, in, uh, in rural Wisconsin, and he has, um, he has some um, recognition of this tradition of public infrastructure. And, and I think that did help him. You know, that was something that was non-controversial for a long time in Wisconsin, this, the support for this public infrastructure. And really you had, it was so bad at times that, you, you know, roads were being um, repaved with, um, with gravel because they couldn't repave them. There was no money in some of these rural areas. And that was, that was costing Walker and as well as the rural schools were being gutted. And in fact, Walker gave a more generous school budget, the last budget, in an effort to kind of um, reverse his declines there. But, but Evers did relatively well in the rural areas um, for a Democrat these days. So I think there is room there. And Russ Feingold, not that long ago, was winning. And Tammy Baldwin, who's relatively progressive um, national Democrat, does very well throughout the state and wins easily. So I think, you know, there is still that, that possibility uh, for someone to tap into it. Um, so at the end of the book, there's a line where you say that solidarity are, is our only hope against divide and conquer politics, but it's unclear whether solidarity can flourish without the infrastructure of the labor movement. Um, and it's a small line, but I think it's a very important one because you know we have to recognize um, how hard it will be to build our strength back without a strong labor movement. Um, and so the labor movement can't be rebuilt overnight so what can, can be done to nurture effective solidarity in the absence of that labor movement? Well, you know, I'm only, I, I'm always describe myself as a journalist, so it's tough for me to uh, offer advice. I will say though that um, the attacks on labor are um, indicative of its unique power also to bridge racial divides um, or to mitigate racism and other um, 
kind of uh, divisive forces in our society. I do think, you know, it's strange, like there's a paradox, like with the Wisconsin movement against Walker was defeated, but then you had enormous, you know, teacher strikes in other places uh, that came out of it. And I do think that the Act 10 protest did light a spark. Um, I do think, you know, if there's any pressure to be exerted on Biden, and it certainly seems like he's has making more overt noises about being pro labor, that is one area that might um, be fruitful to, you know, try to extract concessions. Um, Cause Trump was very, very hostile to labor in, in, in reality. And, um, and, and Obama did very little um, to, to buttress it. Um, so I think that is, you know, American labor law is very, very, it makes it very, very difficult. However, I do see there, there's an awakening around the importance of labor, I think that wasn't there, certainly not prior to the protests against Act 10. And I think it's become even more pronounced as income inequality, you know, goes through the roof and the atomization of our society politically is really related to the decline of the of the labor movement. I think I think that's really key, and I think people are becoming aware of it. Um, and and I think um, I, I don't know what the forecast is, but you see more interest, much much more interest in labor, and a lot of willingness for people to strike. You know, as I said, those teachers. In, in places that you wouldn't expect it, you know, West Virginia, Oklahoma, other places, um, there's a real desperation that could be sparked, I think, you know, um, and I think you, you always need some leaders. It's, it's, you know, I'm largely of the view that it's large, you know, politics changes through grassroots, but there's, there's always a symbiotic relationship, you know, I mean, I don't think, you know, Without Roosevelt, a lot of those gains wouldn't have been achieved, you know. And so, so um, they obviously politicians have to be pressured, but there has to be some willingness to see it that way. And of course, Sanders was the most outspoken as being, you know, pro labor. And um, but I think I think there's a growing awareness, and even in some of the things I've seen from Biden, he has made um, maybe that being the most um, striking concession to progressives, at least in rhetorically. I don't know what they'll do. And he's bringing on a lot of people that are not very pro-labor. So, you know, there's always rhetoric and then there's reality. Yeah. And you hear it, you know, a lot from people my age. I mean, luckily I, I am in a union. I'm a public school teacher, but a lot of young people, they want a union, but it's just like, okay, what's, what's the first step. But um, I think I agree with you that there is an awareness that something like that is needed. It's hard to organize. And that is one thing that the government right. could, could, could make easier, you know, and, right. and that is a problem here. It's it's very, very difficult, so. Yeah, um, so I think the last question, um, you know, you, you talked about how patient the right wing has been, and I was struck by reading the book, ju just how effective they were as organizers. I mean, I think one caveat is, it's a lot easier when you have all the money and the resources that kind of tends to make things a little easier, but you know, you were right that they were patient. So, you know, what can the left learn from the right about how we can organize ourselves through institutions like Alec Heritage Foundation, obviously not that we're using those institutions, but the use of institutions patiently over a long time to grow a base and um, grow our movement. What, what can we learn from that? Well, I think it is really important to build the, an infrastructure. And in fact, that's one of the key quotes I think in the book is by this woman, Chris Taylor, the Alec kind of spy who's, who, um, remarked how, you know, the relentlessness of the right. I mean, they're willing to accept an election loss um, because a lot of their gains are locked in. And, you know, I, I'm sure many of the viewers here remember what Margaret Thatcher said, you know, her greatest success was new labor. And I think they've been able to change the paradigm. And But I do think, you know, the Sanders movement did push back against that and they reestablished a different, a non- uh, you know, a space for um, non-neoliberal economics, economic populist policy, uh, social democratic policy, and um, but I do think an infrastructure is is important. And there, there's just and there is a problem with funding. I will say there's another problem 
that the right seems to have solved better than the left is they have more ideological cohesion than the left, especially, I mean, you know, there's a really, it's a very top-down movement. I was at some of these ALEC conferences and it's, um, it's very hierarchical and, and, um, but there is a lot of cohesion around really economic policy and they will sacrifice they don't really care that much about the other stuff at the end of the day. And even, you know, um, it was funny to me because I knew Trump was the, the falseness of right wing populism was apparent really early to me because I was at an Alec conference in 2016 in the summer of 2016 and Pence was the featured guest and he was there to reassure them that he was one of them. So all of these kind of, um, heterodoxies around social security and so on. He, he didn't really um, believe them. And, and, uh, and Stephen Moore was there to basically say the same thing. So I think there is an ideological coherence that the, the right shares, and that's emerging on the left, but then the Democratic Party is so fragmented, you know, so I think it's, it's difficult. Whereas I see the Republican Party as much more cohesive, which makes it easier for them to build this infrastructure. All right. Well, thanks so much, Dan. This was great. Um, everyone go out and read, read your book. Um, but uh, yeah, the fall of Wisconsin, the conservative conquest of a progressive bastion, the future of American politics. Um, very relevant reading for this time. Um, so thanks so much, Dan. I hope to have you on again. I would love to. Thank you guys so much. It's a great show. It really is terrific. So I really, I really appreciate it. Great. Thanks. Thanks again. Okay, on mute. <laughs> Jen, I think you're on mute. Thank you. Sorry about that. No worries. <laughs> um, okay, so I think we are actually going to have Kale on now. Uh, if there are any questions, uh, Kale, what's up? How's it going? Your your debut, your debut, your debut on the Jacobin Show. Thank you. It's it's truly an honor and a pleasure, um, <laughs> and uh, it's what I've always wanted. This is this is really the pinnacle of the year so far. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> Um, but I, yeah, I'm going to throw some questions to you from the chat. If people still have questions, you can put them in the live chat. Oh, did I, did I freeze? Oh no, you're good. Am I back? Oh no. Did I freeze? Oh no. Fuck. Am I back? Yeah. Am I, yes? Okay. Yes. Sorry. It's uh there's a storm in New York right now. Um, perfect timing right as I come on. Sorry, you guys. Um, if you have questions, put them in the chat, but I'm going to read a couple of them. Um, Chris Morlock says, The Jacobin Show is such a breath of fresh air. This is the kind of class-based political commentary we need. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, uh, Chris. <laughs> Chris wants to know, uh, where did you guys come from? Uh, I, I don't think we did like proper intro yeah, yet. <laughs> I love that question. Um, Paul, Paul, you go first. Well, there's like a long and short answer, but I mean, the Quick one. Um, so my my father is actually from Barbados in the Caribbean. Um, for a lot of family there that was involved, still involved with the Labor Party. Um, but yeah, I mean, long story short, um, I, I wasn't born in Barbados, but I grew up in the in the Philadelphia area. I've been in Philadelphia about ten years. Um, really, what lit the spark for me politically was my freshman year at Temple. The Temple University Hospital nurses went on strike, and I got involved in sort of like student solidarity. And they won that strike. It was a powerful example of like what you can actually do to stand up to corporate power. And ever since then I've been labor all the way. So I don't know if that was the answer you were looking for, but there it is. And now you're in Philly. Right. Yeah. I mean, I've been in Philly, uh, yeah, like a little over 10 years. Um, so I was actually born in Burlington, Vermont, and I'm going to date myself a little bit, but when I was born there, um, Bernard was mayor. Uh, mm -hmm. So I feel very proud and happy that I was a very early constituent of his. Um, and I actually grew up in Boise, Idaho, which is where I am now. Um, so, you know, one of the things I should actually also mention, she's not here, but Ariella grew up in a rural area too. She's from Maine. So I think one of the things we want to do at some point is to have an episode on like rural America and like what it means to like not be from the East or West coast, I guess. Um, no, Paul, you're still invited, even though, <laughs> right. uh, 
Uh, and I actually, um, you know, have lived in like Portland, Oregon and New York. So, you know, I, I have been on the coasts. Um, I, I haven't been in Idaho the whole time, um, but I am now. So. As a, as a coastal elite, I'm deeply offended. <laughs> Sorry, Kale, you're not invited. <laughs> no, I mean, you are. You know, it's a true deplorable stuff. Am I right, Kale? It's just, uh, yeah, you're, uh, you got some problematic views, friend. <laughs> um, no, but, uh, so a couple other questions. Um, here's a tough one, fun one. Uh, can the labor movement be rebuilt with Taft Hartley still in place? <laughs> Paul, that's yours. <laughs> yeah, I mean, what's kind of interesting about labor law and labor history is like, it was always illegal until enough people broke the law. So like, I think a great example is public sector unions. Like it was illegal for public sector unions, public sector workers to form a union and to strike. And in the sixties, there was a wave of people just saying, screw it, we're striking. We want a union. And they said, okay, fine. Um, so, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, that's a good question. I think there are certain labor law reforms that can and should be done. Like Taft Hartley definitely puts a limit, but I think, this is almost like the cliche left answer. Like if there is going to be, uh, it's going to be reborn. It's going to be in this sort of mass movement type way, kind of like the CIO was like, there was an angle of that, that was patient long-term organizing for sure. And it couldn't have happened without that. But at the same time, there was this moment and it was this real rush. And it was the same thing within the sixties with the public sector. And it kind of, that rush kind of just obliterates all these laws. Cause it's like, the reality on the streets and workplaces are is more potent than the law. So that might be kind of like a disappointing answer, but I think it's going to come that way where we might hopefully can reach a moment where we can just kind of obliterate Taft Harley in this kind of new wave. But I, I do think the precondition for that is having, you know, the, that patient long organizing and, you know, people with the view, uh, you know, of building a militant labor movement being there before that happens. Something that always gives me a little hope is, um, you know, prior to the New Deal, the labor law in the U.S. was like way more draconian than it even is now. And um, that actually was one of the factors that kind of led to this uh, spark of labor militancy. So, you know, if it happened right. once before, hopefully it can happen again. Right. And I also think about how uh, with a lot of the teacher strikes that you saw in West Virginia and, you know, Ohio and elsewhere in 2018, um, I think a lot of those were, if not illegal, yeah. uh, not sanctioned by the union or or exactly. parts of parts of it weren't sanctioned by the union. So, you know, to what you said, Paul, um, people are always going to, I guess, cause trouble. Uh, and let's rely on that. Right. Yeah. Think about, you know, I always say, I mean, if you think it's hard now and it is hard now, I mean, especially if you're at Amazon, I mean, just think about at a time you're working 12 hours a day you are at a union meeting and it's perfectly fine that people are coming in with baseball bats, breaking it up and there's nothing you can do. So and you don't have the internet. Right. Yes. And no Twitter. What, what did they do? Um, so, you know, it, it's possible. Right. As long as there's capitalism, there's going to be anti-capitalism because it necessarily means that most people get the short end of the stick, that they have to work longer, harder hours. And, uh, and just like like what you were covering earlier, Jen, like there's people across the the spectrum on various cultural issues, but that when it comes to their material interests, their class based interests, they say, yeah, no, I, I need health care. Um, they need uh, raises. And so I think if people if we see if, if like working people see strikes, if you know, if we end up if we're so lucky to see more uh, labor action in one part of the country, it's possible that people in other parts of the country that are in similar situations with similar strong political organizers might go, yeah, actually, um, that's that's a viable route, right? right? So the conditions are always ripe in the sense that people are being screwed over. Um, they're not always ripe in the sense that, you know, there are big macro forces, you know, we're all, you know, we're all dependent in some sense on the boss's profitability, right? That uh, if profits are up, there's not as much to go around to, for the union uh, or for the working the workers in that workplace. So it's not that anything's always possible, but it is always true that people under capitalism are getting screwed. And so there's always the there's always reason to be trying to organize and to be uh, talking to people about the fact that 
no, actually it could be way better and that we right. should be collectively organizing. Right. And I think, sorry, not to like, if you ask me a labor question, I'm going to go yeah. on forever, but Please. even thinking about this idea of- That's what people want. Right. The That's right why wing. we got you. <laughs> there you go. But even this question of the right wing, learning from their, even from a loss. And I think that's another interesting thing about the labor movement. A lot of those veteran CIO organizers in the thirties, they went through the experience of the twenties of things being terrible, but they, you know, they were able to hold on and say, okay, when we come back next time, when there's a tighter labor market, when the job situation is a little better, we know what to do this time around. Um, and then, you know, I don't, there's just no other way than we're going to lose more often and you just got to like learn from whatever loss you get. Right. So a different question, switching gears a little bit, um, but Zachary Rosen asks, how can Democrats reach rural areas which need slash want agricultural subsidies, though sometimes buy into conservative narratives about excessive public spending? So it's not quite the, the cultural economic divide that we were talking earlier, but rural people who are getting screwed over, but who say, yeah, but we don't need big government. Right. I, that is such a hard question. And actually, like, that's another episode I want to do on the show eventually, why people hate the government. There are a lot of reasons why people in the US hate the government. Um, actually, a lot of them are really good <laughs> reasons. Uh, so so I really don't have a good answer um, right now. Uh, Paul, do you have any thoughts? <laughs> uh, you're going to ask the city slicker. Um, <laughs> no, I mean, I do think you know, it would be interesting to look back at the data about how Bernie did in rural areas. But again, I do think there is like this populist strain that could be tapped into. And I think, I mean, not even talking about Democrats, it's something to think about for, there are quite a few rural DSA chapters. And if they think seriously about how to engage in that area, and if they're from that area, they would know better than someone like me, you know, but I think the key here is like, are you going to be a chapter that's like championing the most exotic cultural demands, which probably aren't going to play well, you know, not to be like stereotypical about a rural area, but the culture stuff might not play that well. So um, that's that's my non-answer. Yeah. And I mean, I think also to I mean, not not to like constantly go back to Bernie, but like that is kind of what we do. Um, you know, I think I think the examples that were brought up earlier of how how well he did in Vermont among rural voters there um, and actually how well he did in 2016 in a lot of rural states, including Idaho. He won Idaho's 2016 primary by something like 80 percent to Hillary's 20 percent. And obviously that was 20 that was 2016. And, you know, Hillary had had and has her own baggage. So, you know, you, there there are a couple different interpretations of what happened there. But whatever you can say about Bernie, you know, no one thought no one ever thought that he didn't want more government services, right? And yet, you know, people in one of the most anti-government states in the union, Idaho, uh, home of the militia movement of like weird libertarian compounds uh, of just like, you know, gun toting, uh, showing up at the state capitol, you know, with your assault rifles, like even prior to the whole like anti-lockdown stuff. Some people in Idaho still liked Bernie. So, yeah, again, um, if I had the answer, like we would be seeing a lot more socialists getting elected in rural America. And maybe maybe that is one promising avenue for the future. Um, but it's it's a really good question. Yeah, no, I, I, I think it's I, I don't have a good answer either. I mean, I think something I come back to and I, I talked about this briefly a couple of weeks ago, maybe months ago, I don't know. Time is kind of gone, but um, but a couple of months ago on weekends, uh, I, I mentioned an experience that I had uh, canvassing in Iowa earlier this year for the Iowa caucus for Bernard, and was talking with rural voters, was talking with um, someone who wanted to become a farmer. So maybe not the most, maybe not the right example for this, but someone um, who wanted to become a small business farmer, and Bernie's platform on right to repair. Uh, Bernie's platform, I'm basically saying, uh, you as a working class rural American, you should have far greater control over your job site, basically, over uh, what you do, what machinery you use, what tools you use, because you're the one who uses them, you know how they work, and you should have the right to fix these things when they break down, instead of having to send them to John Deere or one of these other mega corporations. Um, and this is a small example, right? But I think you know, when we emphasize 
certainly, you know, a lot of the economic stuff, but especially the aspects of personal autonomy over your life, over you should, you should be the one in control over how you spend the majority of your waking life. And there's no better way to do that than through a social democratic political agenda, right? Through guaranteeing healthcare so that when you do get sick, you can go to the doctor or uh, having greater control over your workplace, whether that's through something like this in the rural uh, situation or, um, you know, down the line, having uh, worker owned firms or uh, work controlled firms. And, um, and I think these are the aspirations that we should be pushing, especially for rural America. Um, and sp also massive public infrastructure spending that like, yeah. you know, these people who live in these parts of the country where they don't have broadband or they don't have uh, paved roads, they, they don't have clean drinking water. Uh, you know, I think in many ways, we on the left sometimes forget about these like these basic repairs that have to happen but like this is life or death for most people that truly feel forgotten so i think now that doesn't mean that we're going to be effective in communicating that i think we still have to figure out the best strategy to get there but i think i think that's the kind of stuff that people will respond to but again i'm in new york so i don't fucking know, you know there's also yeah discount everything places. he just said right and maybe these places that's still like a residue of like union density in some places especially mm -hmm. you know so and i think that's another thing where like being connected to the labor movement kind of gives you an in that you might not otherwise have and yeah I mean, and i think I mean, again this is like a little bit of a cop out but you know these things obviously take longer than one election cycle which i think is the important thing to remember whenever we're feeling a little sad about bernie or randy bryce or whoever um and and yeah so it's just a i don't know it's kind of a long con i guess right this last one, um, uh, there was a couple of questions that were about this, about uh, unions' relationships to the Democratic Party. And obviously, we've been talking about that. But just to kind of cap it off, um, Shadow Ban Refugee uh, asks, uh, good screen name, uh, asks, much of my union membership, most of, most of his fellow union brothers and sisters despises the Democratic Party. Uh, and he says, for good, uh, goddamn good reason, because they took our money and sold us out in New Mexico. Um, he's asking, how do I disassociate the left from the Democratic Party? Um, and maybe more broadly, we, we ask this all the time and try to work this out, but how should the left and union or organizers be relating to the Democratic Party? Well, I mean, it's tough. I mean, I think... Again, to kind of be like level-headed about it, you know. I, I mean, as much as angry as I get about why why are unions giving money to the Democrats when they screw them over and all this, you know, especially on like state and local levels, like a lot of times there is a genuinely pretty big difference between like a Republican governor and a Democrat governor, and you know, there, there's so there are like material reasons why unions are still tied to the Democrat Party. Um, but I do think someone like Bernie kind of helps that um drawing that line because it's like oh well like we're like bernie i think that's a and that's kind of what was the power of having bernie running like what's the essay if, if you're just a random person on the street it was like well basically we're for what bernie's for and a lot of people can connect with that and i think a lot of people even if they're not experts in politics have a sense that bernie is not a normal democrat you know he's kind of outside of that so i mean that's that that's kind of one thing like we're we're part of that wing of the party that it's kind of like against everything the party is doing. Um, I don't know if you have thoughts, Jen, or I mean, I, I, I agree. Uh, but yeah, I, I don't know. I got nothing on this one, Paul. You're you're taking all the labor stuff, so <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, and it might be a conversation with your coworker, like yeah. The reason, look, the reason our union is giving money to Democrats is like we don't have a better alternative right now. And let's not forget what the Republicans do with labor. Like Democrats might screw us over, but Republicans would love for unions to be done tomorrow. So I think I also, you kind I of- wonder, mm. Sorry, I was gonna say, I also wonder if there's maybe a like internal union question of like beefing up political education. Um, obviously, you know, that used to be like a big part of being in a union. Um, it's sort of, it's sort of less so now. There's obviously uh, 
quite a deep split between union leadership and the rank and file in many cases. Um, but as somebody who's part of a teacher's union, and I think you mentioned once part of like a pretty radical caucus, like what do you make of that internal question? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, and it's kind of spotty, like certain unions, like Communication Workers of America has a really incredible political education program called Runaway Inequality. I actually want to get the author of that on here at some point. Um, so I think that like that is key for, you know, it would have been very easy for if the Democratic Party is not going to do it, unions creating their own education programs or like what has Trump done to labor, you know. Um, but again, it's kind of tied to as unions are declining, it becomes harder and harder to have that infrastructure to, to pull that off. I mean, it's definitely not impossible. I wouldn't say that's an excuse because, again, CWA has been doing a really incredible job. Um, and, and that's also where you can get to start eroding possible, um, you know, racism or xenophobia within the membership. Um, Les Leopold, who who kind of writes the Runaway Inequality Program, he says the way they run it is they, they want people to strongly consider what they're saying. And they're very careful. And this is something I think the left has to learn. Like, we're not preaching at people because he says the minute you're going to call out a worker for something, like, they're going to shut down. And they're saying, like, we just want you to seriously consider and kind of ask open-ended questions and let them come to their own conclusion. And I, and I think that's also a lesson for like, if you're a random leftist in a union, like you gotta kind of come correct. Like you can't lecture people, you know, ask questions, you know, all the classic like organizing things, cause you don't want to be painted in that corner and look like, oh, you're just like the radical leftist dude or, you know, so you kind of have to be careful in your approach. Treat them like they're your comrade, like actually take right. them seriously. like. Treat them like it's your brother right. or sister. And that there's a great, yeah, I've probably brought this up before many times, but there's a great poster that the CIO made in the 30s and it has a worker, you know, on one side of them is a KKK member. The other side of them is a union organizer. And it says, if, if you're not talking to your coworkers, someone else will. Mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's like, you know, if the left is not going to be out there, you know, then of course they're going to be caught up by whoever's promising the most, whether they're, you know, a right wing nut or, or someone else. Right. Yeah. And, you know, I'm fairly partial to what writers like Dustin Costello and Jared Abbott have been advocating for in Jacobin and Catalyst and elsewhere, which is basically that given the actual infrastructure of the party system in America, like we got to have one foot in. Uh, but it's, I think, crucial that the left and uh, left labor people uh, build a unique identity that's distinct from the Democratic Party, that we say we're using the party instrumentally, we need to use the party because we have to actually like be viable for elections. And in most of the country, it's just it is what it is, unfortunately. But, you know, pretty openly say like this is a mutiny, like we are not actually like attached to the Democratic leadership, that we're something else. Um, and I'll just say that, uh, you know, I think as far as this question of like how to build that uh, the unique identity, I think the, it, the left being associated as much as we can with like Medicare for all and expanding health care as, as well as jobs programs, raising wages. This is like just a little shout out to like the labor campaign for single payer that I think yeah. this is like yeah. the, the, the quintessential work that needs to be happening right now on this question of like. Right how do we organize unions around political demands? And I just say one more thing, like, um, and this is where I think the cultural component is important, like for many people, and this is frustrating to people like us that are obsessing with politics, like their vote sometimes literally comes down to like, what is this person's vibe? And like, what is the one word association? And that's, I think like we were in a strong place where I really think you could, you could have gone up to an average person and be like, one word for Bernie, go. They would have said Medicare for all. And that to me is good terrain to fight on. Um, and again, what is his vibe? Oh, Bernie, he's a good guy. He's he's cool. And a lot of people said the same with Trump. Like, oh, he's just like a guy down the street. And so I think we have to think about that in terms of like priorities and candidates. Like when they open their mouth, do they sound like they're in like a fifth year grad school seminar? Or do they sound like someone that you can hear them and it kind of relate to? You know, so I think that's important. Um. I think we should end it there. There's a couple other questions, but um, we'll get to more of them next week when we come back with Ariella. 
Uh, and then we're going to take a quick break, but we'll be back in the new year. Uh, every week, we got you more coverage from The Jacobin Show. So I want to thank our hosts, Jen and Paul, and welcome them to you. <laughs> um, thank you, Kale, for producing, and thanks right. to everybody watching. Yeah, yeah. thanks. The questions are great. Yeah. All right. Um, well, I guess uh, let's say goodnight. Goodnight, guys. Good night. All right. Bye. Good night, guys. All right. Bye.